Welcome to Five Strike Weekly. This week we talk about how we put down the kitties, if we have enough depth to topple Toronto, and we get into your burning questions in the mailbag. We get into all that and more coming up. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ, and this is Michael. And the Resurgence kit made its MLS debut, and LA United took care of business versus the Kitties, winning 2 0 on the night. Yeah, it was uh, a good scoreline, but the performance left a little bit to be desired for sure. But uh, yeah, we were very clinical on the night. And ultimately, you know, the three points is what matters. But, you know, there is a, an aspect of it that, uh, for me, I want to see a little bit, uh, you know, something that's a little bit more replicable. But, uh, yeah, did you, uh, you know, have some overarching thoughts on this match? Yeah, um, I mean, the, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think we're starting to see things go back to a little bit of normalcy in that Atlanta United is back to beating Orlando City. So that's great to see. You love to see it. And uh, hopefully it's, you know, it's uh, it's foretelling of things to come with our relationship with the Disney kitties. Indeed, because, yeah, you know, a lot of pundits had them finishing Maybe supporter shield winners, uh, you know, maybe really high up in the standings. I mean, it still could be a possibility that, yeah, they could finish high in the standings. But uh, supporter shield, that's probably gone. But and uh, that I'm happy about for sure. But uh, yeah, in terms of the performance, yeah, it's just there was a lot of moments where, uh, yeah, there were some some changes. I think that. Uh, Oscar Perea was able to to make that uh, made it a little bit more difficult for us slash yeah we looked a little lost at times during the match but uh, we were able to yeah even as Pineda said it after the match uh, yeah he thought we were grinding quote finding fighting competing and never giving up and the players did well some positives but we have the reminder that we need to do better end quote and, uh, yeah, I think it very much is uh, kind of indicative of uh, what we were saying in the uh, live post-match fan reactions that we did uh, immediately right after the match. And that, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there were some fans that uh, either uh, that came on or uh, in the comments that were questioning, like, oh, shouldn't we be happy <laughs> that we won? And absolutely, yeah, you know, we're always happy that we get the three points, but there is, like I said, the uh, the performance that needs to show that we can do it time and time again, and I don't think this was the performance that uh, would indicate that. Uh, it uh, there, were, there were some times where, um, you know, I think defensively, we, I think, showed the stoutness, but in attack and the connectivity between the lines. I mean, I think we saw probably one of the worst matches from Thiago Amada. That's for sure. Uh, I think the the preseason that he didn't have with the team really reared its, uh, its head here. Uh, you know, but the connection between, you know, our forwards, that was pretty good. I think there was, uh, you know, there was a, a level of that where, uh, you know, Saba, maybe because he was spurned for the uh, Georgia national team call-up, you know, definitely looked motivated. A different man a little bit at times. And Yakumakis always looks motivated. And, uh, you know, I think uh, he was far and away the man of the match here, even though, uh, yeah, Saba got some recognition inside the stadium. Uh, in terms of uh, getting that golden uh, golden spike. But, you know, it is, I think, uh, you know, where Silva, like, at times he was bright, but there were some times he was also almost just giving the ball away a little too uh, too loosely. And, uh, you know, a little bit maybe too much flair instead of the simplicity. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, this first goal from uh 
from Saba. I mean, the just a touch of class from Yorgos Yakomakis outside of the boot. I don't think one of our strikers has ever given a better assist. Actually, I can't think of it because it is it is just put on a dime, put on a plate. Just the weight of the pass, the difficulty of the pass, and basically Saba, while still having something to do here, he was able to uh, be put into just a really good scoring position. And yeah, taking that that touch that uh, pretty much eliminates his man and then uh, at that near post, able to beat Galese, who, lo and behold, on another one, on another one uh, at that night, just very annoying, but beats him on the far post. But, he uh, made one mistake. He yeah. made one mistake that game, and that was it. Yeah, that was it. Because, yeah, no, the uh, I would say the second goal, you know, we'll, we'll get to it, but uh, no, he was, he never had a chance. That's, nope. You know, that's not on Galese. This one, nope. maybe. Because, uh, yeah, like he probably shouldn't have hugged his uh, his post that much. But uh, he did. Lausanitze pretty much just, yeah, like as <laughs> as uh, as finessed of a shot as you could. He almost dribbled it in. He, almost, he didn't like, respect <laughs> Saba at all. He thought, he you know, I'm he just going to cover the real super close range you know near post and then i'm gonna dare him to slot it in in the far post and Saba's like okay no problem <laughs> yeah. like thank you yeah you just gave <laughs> acres of the uh of the net for him and yeah he knew exactly what to do with it and it was Saba time and uh yeah much credit much credit to uh to mike conti for that that call actually like listen to all y'all it's Saba time solid very it's solid sabotage yeah or sabotage that's right yeah yeah but um uh, but yeah and so uh you know the rest of uh that first half maybe not as good maybe not as good as that goal definitely uh, definitely not as good as that goal i would say but uh but we also had some chances uh that uh i would say yeah it was pretty much a pretty back and forth match it some I was on Goals TV, and uh, uh, Jose from Goals TV called Orlando a little toothless, which, okay, maybe in the final third, yeah, but I still think that they made things a little bit difficult for us, too. Like, I think there was some credit that needed to be given to Orlando uh, from a, I think, defensive standpoint, that they were able to cause some some problems for us uh, in some, some areas, but also... They were very physical with us. They oh. it, almost to the degree of yeah, we, we complained like hell uh, after the match uh, on those live post-match fan reactions because I mean I think with good reason the this ref this center ref allowed a lot of things to go for Orlando and on the flip side Atlanta had to get five yellows to their one. And then also you have the aspect of, I feel like he felt the pressure from the fans. He definitely was getting just trounced. I mean, ref, you suck was ringing throughout, and I, you know I don't I don't think he's this occasion was too big for him. You know him uh, being probably USL or lower in terms of a a ref. I think he's from the USL. But, I mean, <laughs> it, he, he let it affect him. And that much was clear. There was some bias. Uh, I mean, I, I think I'm a person that calls it really very much like it is. Uh, it just did not feel like it was a very bipartisan match that was called. But, yeah, I know we talked about it a little bit during the, uh, you know, the live post match, but uh, yeah, you have some thoughts uh, on you know up to this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've actually a lot of thoughts, but like this specifically on the refs will stay for a minute. Um, I did hear something about like that could be perhaps this is speculation. I think that um, the week before prior there was like a a a lot of red cards given out, 
um, by these, you know, replacement refs. And maybe speculation again here, so take it with a grain of salt, that there was word from on high to maybe cut down on all the red cards that are being thrown out all willy-nilly. So maybe that's why we didn't, he was hesitant to give out a yellow or a red card when there was so many yellows. And, and I honestly think uh, the Swede on Orlando probably should have seen red um, for grabbing at the neck slash face area, which, you know, is pretty much an instant red. So um, yeah, I, uh, I think that's probably what should have happened. And we were pretty annoyed about that in the post game um but you know it's it's you could also they could review it but apparently they didn't think there was anything wrong with it so all above board i guess and that's the thing it's uh well <laughs> it's not all above board i feel like because <laughs> yeah when the refs it's like yeah var or otherwise uh they're all wrong uh i mean it, it is you know it's a cause for concern because well players were getting injured <laughs> players yeah. were you know they absolutely are not being protected at this point and okay sure it might happen to another team or it might you know, like that's the thing it will happen to us <laughs> and so that quality that that standard needs to be raised otherwise yeah the next time it happens well yeah you know i'm not gonna just laugh at it and just be like, oh, brush it on the rug. Like, oh, yeah, you know, haha, it happened to Orlando or whatever or whomever. Like, because it's actually very hypocritical when it does happen to us. And right. I was you know, quiet when they came for Orlando. I was quiet. Yeah. When they right. came for Houston. <laughs> exactly. But then, you know, and so it's just yeah. like, you know, you got to be consistent. And, you know, I'm going to complain if it's. Uh, biased or not and so i mean you know it, it is what it is but i mean yep yeah. when shonda silva also gets a yellow for no reason you know in that incident where Janssen for, be, for much, being mad that the ref yeah. didn't like penalize him more like that's ridiculous to give him yeah, a yellow exactly and it's not like i, I didn't see him throw a yellow you know, type of like, you know, the, uh, this, uh, what do you call it? The gesture, you know, which would, yes, that would deserve a yellow. And if he did, okay. But I don't recall that. And I mean, it's just, just frankly, like it's, uh, yeah, the, uh, the lockout for the refs, this is what it is. Like there's levels to this. It can get worse. <laughs> like, these replacement refs also can get worse. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, if we're talking about, which we'll talk about, like, just the standards, man, these are lowering standards. Mind you, Messi is in this league right now, and we have replacement refs. Such a bad are, look. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what? Anyway. Uh, so... Let's uh let's move on into the second half, and uh, yeah, uh, Lapsenitze and uh, Brooks Lennon, they were able to link up here, uh, and yeah, Saba he found a through ball for Brooks Lennon for our second goal here, and uh, yeah, Lennon, man, I don't think I've seen him skin a man so hard. It's that whole Calvin Harris meme. Yeah. He's Word. still he's still sliding. If you can exactly. hear, if you listen exactly. closely, you might be able to still hear. Him. <laughs> yeah, it's man, like it's the Rainbow Road. He is he's just gone, and uh, <laughs> the the defender, like who knows where he is now. But mm. uh, but Lennon, he was able to uh, beat him twice, lay it off to Yakumakis outside of the box. Who Yakumakis? I think if you watch the play beforehand, it he's got this wherewithal, and it, he's got that swagger right now that he can score from anywhere. Like he definitely set up shop outside of the box to create some space for himself, and then he launches this, kisses that underneath uh, underneath the the crossbar, and it is an unbeatable, unbeatable 
goal. I mean, Galese, like I said earlier, couldn't do anything about it. Uh, yeah, under the crossbar and in, and Yakomaki sees fist pumping, uh, kind of that lower fist pumping all the way into the corner. And uh, yeah, you know, there's there's one part of me that's, in terms of the the turf that makes me sad, is I love a knee slide, and he uh-huh. used to do knee slides a lot with Celtic, and uh, you can tell he he's like maybe wanting to do it, but it's it's that rug burn that will yeah. inevitably happen. That <sighs> like I I love uh, I love when the whole team just knee slides. So good, so good. But uh, alas, yeah, it's a you know, it's a great goal, and we're we up two nil. Just need to score away on Grassmore. I know exactly. It's just, uh, uh, yeah, that's a whole other thing which we'll talk about. But <laughs> yeah, scoring away, yeah, well, might be pie in the sky sometimes. But uh, but yeah. It basically, this goal got him back into uh, the Golden Boot race. Uh, he shares a lead of it, but it's his fourth goal uh, of the season. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of good things, uh, you know, happen in this match. Which we'll get to, uh, you know, kind of in the news. But uh, I think there were some moments that also were very concerning. I mean, Guzan went down. Maybe it was a hamstring or something. Who knows? But yeah, like the uh, the trainers had to come onto the time, pitch. Time is running out for him. It's yeah, it just seems it, like any day now. Right. It was a little bit odd. It was like, uh, like I said on the uh, the post match, I was like, man, that'd be a tough way to go. Like that is not how I want uh, Braguzan to uh, to really lose his spot here because we know. Yeah. We know Josh Cohen is going to be the... He's the heir apparent. But this would be a harsh way. And thankfully it wasn't. But, uh, you know, he wasn't the only player that, uh, yeah, you know, really felt it. Because, yeah, we basically had two of our defenders had to go off. And, uh, I mean... I think I think most of our team was going to... Yeah. You know, kind of be feeling it the next day after this game because they, right. like you said at the outset, Orlando played us tough and hard and physical, and that was that was, yeah. it was tough to see. A lot of our guys looked like they were going down and they could have had potential injuries. We find out later that one actually did. Um, it's you know, it's it, it was not great. It was a gutsy win with at cost. So yeah. I don't know if it'd be you know, it's always worth it to beat the kitties, but it's like. That's rough when you have your starting defender be out for the foreseeable. So that's that's not great. <laughs> right, exactly. And so yeah, Gregerson. I mean, he was uh, shoulder checked into the uh, into the boards after the whistle. And uh, yeah, that that's some stuff that yeah should have been curbed. Uh, I mean, there was a little bit of a talking to early on in the match from the ref where you know he gave it to both sides of like, okay, yeah, you know. Uh, these are warnings or whatever, but I, I don't feel like there were actual uh, warnings that were judicious. They were definitely, you know, one-sided. But uh, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, some of the uh, other things that uh, did happen in this match, um, yeah, I mean, Pineda he said after the the match that Saba was impressive, quote unquote. Uh, more aggressive in getting the ball in better areas and tactically, mentally, has been getting better. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, he rates the way Gigi, uh, not only with his ability to score goals, but uh, he rates him in how he does with his defensive actions as well. And, uh, I mean, Brad Zan, he said, like, he, he was frank. He, was, he said, to be honest, I don't know if this week was better than last week. He said the performance was good in a sense, but sloppy. Team struggled and stretches to play out of the back. He said, quote, we can be better, end quote. And so, yeah, I think the uh, the thing that was good, uh, obviously, besides the goals, uh, Pineda also pointed it out, Muyomba and Slish uh, said did a great job, quote unquote, covering the midfield and chasing down Orlando's playmakers. 
and he credits them for disrupting Orlando's game plan and causing them to get quote unquote desperate. So yeah, absolutely. That's that's definitely a thing that I noticed that uh, you know we stymied their playmakers. We didn't allow them to really like create rhythm in order to really get clear cut chances. Because yeah, yeah while they uh, there were some kind of minor chances. Uh, and yeah, they, I believe, rattled the crossbar as well. It's, you know, uh, ultimately, like, they did the job that needed to be done in the midfield, which wasn't always done last year. That's for damn sure. But, uh, and yeah, Panetta also mentioned uh, the team needing to create a habit of maintaining clean sheets. And uh, yeah, he... Uh, he said that the team did well in a low block while holding the lead, made the call to play in a back five, and uh, some subs were due to cramping fitness issues, which, uh, yeah, you know, I think that's w where it is where, like we're saying, yeah, you know, a little bit of the rough play, a little bit of the, uh, whatever it is, like, yeah, I mean, it's a little early for the, the cramping, I feel like, but, I mean, I guess they haven't reached the match fitness levels that uh, we want them to be at. And maybe that's the uh, the culprit, but um, but yeah. Uh, in terms of Pineda and going with the back five, I think it did see out the match. Definitely credit to him for you know be, recognizing that uh, some players, not only fitness wise, were lacking, but also yeah, we were at a point where we needed to maybe preserve some legs, get some fresher. Uh, Pressure legs to kind of see out the match, and it worked. You know, yeah. we were able to. I mean, one thing get that we control. talk about sometimes is that you know Pineda doesn't like to change formation or adopt a more defensive posture when in a situation that might uh, require it. And I feel like against Orlando in this type of game, um, which they were controlling the ball. They were possessing the ball, winning that battle a lot more than we were. They were getting a second balls. They were putting a lot more pressure on us in our defensive half. And in order to kind of identify a way to get back at them, um, you know, through all this pressure is to then go, well, maybe we should just try and hit them in transition and counter. And we did, and we were lethal at it. And that was great to see um, because in the past, there has been times where we've decided to just continue to try and play you know like you know slow build up possession and hope for the best and we just kind of get crushed um and in this case we decided you know five in the back let's do you know hit them on counters and then the, our transition game was brutal i really like to see that it, it's similar to watching previous Atlanta united teams in previous seasons you know basically be orlando they come out possess the ball doesn't go anywhere they all of their chances lead to nothing and the other team just sits there and goes come on come at me oh you made one mistake now we're just going to send the ball forward this guy named sabalobjanice is going to get it and score on you out of nowhere or like you know we're going to do a cut back pass to george you know yorgos and we'll score there like it's just like because it started with like Saba and Brooks Lennon just like screeching down the sides like it's just it it kind of felt good that we weren't the team having this happen to again yeah we were the ones doing it to them so right. it, it, at least in that regard we have a little it seemed like there's a little bit more versatility in that the players identified the coach also identified as you said we need to kind of go in that avenue more than the previously held one and it worked and it was good to see mm -hmm. and i think it all plays together because well yeah you know the verticality that we uh definitely played with a lot in 2017 2018 uh yeah i think it was apparent here uh because yeah it's like on the ball that's where we were i mean in terms of uh you know playing through the lines it just really wasn't our night and uh you know at home it's it's odd it's uh it's not usually the case but <coughs> excuse me and i mean almada his off night i think definitely had a 
had a play and a part in this where, uh, you know, Pineda, he mentioned, uh, yeah, that the second half after a lackluster performance, uh, or he he told Almada in the second half uh, after a lackluster performance that, oh, I wouldn't highlight one player not doing great. I think in general, we were not making the right decisions, the right passes, the right movement. He said, honestly, the first half he got on the ball, he was very dangerous. It was at the end where he started to maybe to ma feel maybe a little isolated. He had to dribble three, four players, and, you know, not many players committing as forward as we were doing in the first half, uh, which, yeah, absolutely, that was the case. But there was also a counterattack that uh, he was definitely a little bit indecisive as well, where he probably should have just taken the shot on his right. Instead, he took an extra... Uh, touch to be, you know put it on his left to maybe pass it when he was in the box just shoot yeah call you know? me crazy but you should never be trying to dribble four players like yeah. <laughs> i don't even i don't care if you're all alone by yourself in the opponent's half you shouldn't be trying to do that if you're all alone i don't know sprint to the corner or something wait for reinforcements delay or just cr like do one of his famous long crosses to the side of the field or right. you know look for the guy that's eventually coming if they are taking so long but they'll eventually come if they see you up there needing help i just you shouldn't ever be trying to dribble four players it's just mm -hmm. that's just not the play yeah it was shades of uh bad ezekiel barco ball and yeah, um, maybe not quite the the same actions, but it was that type of, uh, yeah, you know, it's that when you're on a team and there's a far and away better player than everybody else, uh, and that is the case, you know, Almada is uh, definitely our best player, but there's no need for him to keep the ball for that long when there's players that are, you know, willing and capable uh you know as runners um throughout the match and so yeah it's especially when you have edwin mascara like okay yeah he, he's maybe not fantastic on the ball but he's a runner for you he's always going to run and you know especially late in that match you know i think he was uh an option and so but um yeah you know uh Pineda did mention that uh yeah Eventually, we know Tiago's ability on the ball is impressive, and he will get better. And yeah, I'm not worried about Amada, but it is—it was not a hallmark match in terms of his career. And luckily, but, it didn't have to be. That's that's yeah. like kind of what I was alluding to earlier. That good teams, when you have an off night, so your best players maybe aren't showing up, something's off. You can still find a way to win, and we did. Yeah, indeed. So that's back-to-back -back wins at home. And uh, yeah, even though the numbers weren't exactly in our favor for everything, uh, yeah, we got the more shots on target, uh, edged it in shots, and our XG was uh, definitely, you know, just slightly better, or like, not slightly better, double. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, we had the, the real better chances, to be fair. Uh, we just... Yeah, we probably should have put two more away. It's yeah, we mentioned in the, the post match. This was a weird one. Like it could have been three, four nil, but it also could have been yeah, you know, even less than that to a degree of uh, you know where they actually scored one, and uh, it could have been a two one match. It could have been two two. Like it's uh, yeah, yeah. There was there's some luck involved for sure in this one, and. Uh, that's where the concern is, for sure. Because, yeah. Uh, wrapping up a bow on this one. Unless you have a final thought. I hate seeing Glaze just pull out amazing saves like that to keep them in the game. Yeah. I mean, that was when we were only up by one over them. And he was able to deny Derek Williams like twice and like some, one other uh, save as well. Like it was... I'm just... I'm like, damn. That... Because that, that gave Orlando momentum and confidence to come back into the game. Right. It's like saving a penalty shot. Like, it's just, it's, that was, that was scary to see. Because I was like, if this game is going to turn, this is where it will turn. And I was, you know, like, yeah. on the edge of my seat, like, oh gosh, not like this. Please not like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, uh switch in uh, the matrix not like this yeah but uh <laughs> yeah it's 
yeah, the, the double save, incredible, but also incredibly frustrating. Yeah, that's like Derek Williams, man, those are some good chances. What does the man have to do? <laughs> right, man. Anyway, yeah, because it's like uh, his two chances were not consecutive double saves, but uh, it was pretty much, I think, one corner after the other. And so it's like, whew, that would have iced it for sure. Uh completely put it out of reach but uh either way yeah uh that puts a bow on this match review and we will be playing toronto fc over the weekend and we'll have that match preview later on in this episode but let's get into the news and the standings uh we are seventh in the east and gold difference of four uh of course the two wins and one draw but uh yeah, we're the only team in the top nine that have only played three matches. Uh, Miami, of course, are up top, uh, having played five and then have ten points. But uh, Columbus, same number of points at four games played. I think, yeah, Columbus, probably the class of the East. That's going to be uh, difficult to catch them, but uh, hopefully... Uh, you know, there will be uh, some sputters for them because nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect in this league. But, uh, yeah, so far they are one of pretty much uh, three teams that are undefeated. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Philadelphia rounds it out as uh, a team that's drawn three times. Uh, you have Nashville that's also also drawn three times, but won once. Cincinnati, I mean, we know Cincinnati is probably going to be pretty, pretty good. I think Columbus as well. So, uh, but you know, not everyone will make it in terms of unscathed into the next match day for sure. But uh, yeah, so Caleb Wiley, uh, congrats to him. He made his 55th start. That's most starts in all competitions for an Atlanta United homegrown player. I mean, that's amazing. He's only 19. He's only Incredible. 19 years old. Yeah. Like, for an Atlanta native as well, I mean, this is this is going to be incredible. Like, he he has the whole just future ahead of him. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be really, really amazing to see where he can uh, take these levels, uh, you know, health willing. And, uh, but Brad Zan, he also made his 200th appearance. Uh, and he marked it with a with the first clean sheet of the season for LA United. So congrats to Brad Guzan. And he had, he had a good he had a good game. He had some big he saves. He did. He did exactly. It was, uh, yeah. He's he's been rewinding the clock. I mean, it was it's one of those like uh, even a shot from distance. Uh, he was able to cover from uh, on his far post as well. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's definitely something that's like. Uh, you know, it's good. The competition is good. He's definitely, he's thriving off of it and uh, may it continue. I mean, because really, I only care about Atlanta United winning. And so, like, if it's Josh Cohen or Brad Guzan, it doesn't matter to me. Like, it could be either of them. But um, also, moving on from that, Yakumakis. Uh, he landed on the MLS Team of the Match Day this week for the second straight week. He also was nominated for the MLS Goal of the Match Day and MLS Player of the Match Day again. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't win those, which I don't know. It's the uh, the overhead goal was good. It was a little close, so it's like, but you know, the overhead goals always win when they're. When they're there, and you know, uh, St. Louis, they have a lot of fans right now. Like, we don't dominate these uh, these polls like we used to. It's a uh, it's a thing. We need to. We need to get back to that. But uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, moving on from that, the uh, international window is upon us. But uh, yeah, we're gonna play, obviously. But we have six players and uh, also a seventh one that will be missing. Uh, from the, the match over the weekend. But uh, the ones on international duty, Luis Abram with Peru. Uh, 
uh, Thiago Amada with Argentina, uh, Ajani Fortune with Trinidad and Tobago, Yorgos Yakomakis with Greece, of course, Bartosz Szlisch with Poland, and then uh, Caleb Wiley with the U.S. Youth, uh, the U23 squad, actually. And uh, so, yeah, it's going to be... <laughs> It's gonna be dire. Five starters yeah. are missing. Yeah. And a starter from last year as well with Louisa Brom. So I right. mean it is uh you have that. You have also Tego Mata and uh Caleb Wiley. They might have a little showdown in the knockout round, uh, because of the Olympic soccer tournament. Uh yeah, basically it's uh you know, some friendlies for that, but uh whew, you know, that could be interesting. But, um, you know, the, uh, it, it's just one of these things, like, I, I don't like being club over country, but, uh, you know, this just kind of solidifies it a little bit more, even sometimes, because, you know, the fact that we're playing during this, it just, <laughs> I, I have so many qualms, so many qualms, but, uh, you know, I think, the bigger thing about this is that how does this, like I've said in previous episodes, how does this grow the league? Because we have way too many issues uh, that cannot be, like, you have all these stars that are not part of uh, the weekend's matches where, okay, even with Messi, like, you have Messi in the league right now, and uh, yes, he's taking... Uh, you know, I guess probably at least one match off because he cannot play with Argentina. Like he's being rested. Uh, maybe there's a an injury or something like that as well. He just is not going with Argentina. So there's a very unlikely instance that he's going to play over the weekend as well. Like Argentina as a country is just going to be pissed at Tata Martino, and people are in Argentina are already pissed at Tata Martino be real <laughs> like he uh he's not exactly the most welcome in a lot of parts of uh of argentina but uh you know you have this you have the aspects that i mean you know is this a good advertisement for the league you have most of your star players that are out and then you have teams that you know the the worser teams they have their star players. So you're almost being punished for having star players. It's just outrageous. Like it's Or uh, you can be lucky like Columbus and be like, well, Darlington Abbey just doesn't play for his national team, so you get your best player to just be forever never called away. Exactly. And that used to be us. Yeah. <laughs> but uh you know, and it worked out, obviously, because that's what we would take advantage of. But this is he plays every club game forever and never a national team game. Exactly. And th these are the issues that MLS needs to address. Yeah. So, I mean, let me uh, like push back for a second because, you know, how, in terms of like, how does this advertise the league? Well, this doesn't, of course. But what is this in service to do? This allows us to have, well, at least not have, but in, it gives more room for League's Cup which that in their mind is the advertisement for the league so in their mind we'll sacrifice whatever we got to sacrifice whether it be like they talked about us open cup participation or you know we have to play through international breaks um they're willing to do all those types of things in order for league's cup to work because that's their big payday and that's their way that they're going to show off messy to the world right in which case yeah you know the devil's advocate point i get but, you know, it's about MLS. It's not about Leagues Cup. Like, Leagues Cup is just the, the competition that's the... What's, what's the difference anymore? It's so, the same yeah, thing. I, I, I get it. I get it. But it's, you know... Like, they probably like Leagues Cup more than the MLS regular season. Probably brings them in more money. It probably does, to a degree. And especially when Messi won it. I mean, yeah. Like, it's just... Uh, it's, all, it's all gravy for them. But... For, as a fan, I feel like it's, you know, like 
the the season ticket holders are punished. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, I'm gonna be honest. Like the incentive to to watch this match <laughs> over the weekend, it's dampened. Like we don't have our best players. <laughs> Like and, it, it, and we'll get into it, but Toronto has their whole full power squad, basically. So we're exactly. gonna it's what are we, we're running into a buzzsaw. It's like we're yeah. putting kids, our twos essentially, up against Lorenzo Insigne and uh in and Federico Bernadeschi. Like what yeah. Yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah, we're yeah oh, man. We'll get uh, into it. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the players that will be playing, it's uh ooh. They have a task in front of them. But anyway, uh, so uh, like we alluded to as well, Steon Gregerson, he suffered a meniscus injury against Orlando, and uh, he will be unavailable for Saturday. And apparently there is no timetable yet. That's according to uh, the press conference. Uh, so from, from what the brain trust of all the many doctors who <laughs> inhabit our Discord... They all gave their opinions about what does this kind of injury mean? And they're like, well, depending on the type of meniscus injury, it can be like three, five weeks or something like that, or it can be much longer, depending if it's like a tear or not. So, you know, take that medical advice with a grain of salt because yeah. who knows <laughs> uh, the credentials of these Discord doctors, but they felt as though they wanted to give their opinion. Um, and it, does not bode well um it just concerns me quite a bit and it just it's his the new he's on the new team he's starting out strong doing really well and then this crap happens it's such a heartbreaker it is especially yeah i mean he's he's our third dp it's like it, it's a curse like we we basically how many times have we had all of our dps like it's just it's not often. <laughs> it is not often. The uh, it's sad. It's really just sad. I think it's another symptom of uh, of kind of how we're we're being hampered in this league. You know, not just us, just all the teams. But uh, there are reinforcements, and so LA United they announced on Wednesday that uh, Mexican forward Daniel Rios is. Coming on loan from Liga MX side Chivas uh, for the duration of the 2024 MLS season. And uh, yeah, uh, Rios, he came, uh, well, he previously has played for Nashville and uh, Charlotte FC. He's got nearly 200 professional appearances and uh, he holds a green card and he will occupy a supplemental roster spot. So he's not on high wages. He will not take an international spot. So in terms of depth, you know, it's a pretty shrewd move. Um, yeah, you know, Carlos Bocanegra, he mentioned uh, that uh, we have been looking to strengthen our depth and attack and find a proven goal scorer who knows MLS. Daniel is a player we are familiar with from his previous stops in the league. And looking ahead to a busy summer with MLS, US Open Cup, and Leagues Cup, along with the potential to lose several players to both the Euros and Copa America, we believe Daniel brings quality to our team and adds competition to the group. And as well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, you have the Olympics as well. So, uh, but, um, yeah, you know, so he's a player that uh, 6-1 uh, in terms of the... Uh, Goal scoring prowess. Uh, so, it with Nashville, he scored six goals in 33 total uh, appearances, rather, and he was their first ever MLS signing. Uh, and as well with Charlotte FC, he made 30 appearances, scored nine goals across all competitions. So, I mean, it's not a fantastic return, but it is somewhat of a return. Uh, 29 year old. Uh, so, you know. Uh, not exactly spring chicken, but he, uh, you know, as a backup, as a, a player that uh, from the left side in terms of uh, a left footer, uh, gives us some different options. You know, maybe we play uh, two up top sometimes. Maybe we uh, can also, you know, at least this week as well, just give a different look and, uh, you know, different 
parts of the pitch uh, to attack from. So, you know, not the worst if he is able to be match fit and play this weekend. But, uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on Daniel Rios? Um, I'll kind of talk about it in reverse order. I don't think he's probably going to play this weekend. Um, just makes more sense for Pineda to keep his formation that he's been doing um, and to keep players in it that have familiarity with it, which is Jamal. So um, I think we'll see Jamal start in Gigi's spot, but, you know, that will be for the predicted starting 11 for next game. We'll get into that. Um, but I will say about this guy, it you know, Daniel, while he was at Chivas, he's only scored one goal in his time there. That's a little concerning that he's been experiencing a bit of a poverty of goal scoring, um, a bit of a drought. So hopefully that doesn't follow him here. Hopefully he'll see more kind of the um, proportion that he had when he was in Nashville or Charlotte where, you know, he scores some goals and that's pretty much all we need him for. So hopefully he can do that. And hopefully Chivas is not some kind of, you know, harbinger of bad things to come with him. Yeah. And uh, just to be clear, uh, when I mentioned two up top, uh, it's more probably later on in the match. But, uh, you know, it's uh, starting a match too. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I I don't ever see us, I think, starting uh, with two strikers. You know, that's uh, that's definitely something that would be a pretty helter skelter from Pineda, which I, I don't really see him doing that. But um, he's a creature of habit. Yeah, exactly. And frankly, I'm not really sure I want to see that either, anyway. But uh, you know, to start off a match, we we need creators, like more so than uh, and. Uh, you know, unless, unless maybe it's against a, like, Philadelphia Union with their diamond midfield. But, uh, but anyway, so, uh, you know, definitely some good depth that uh, hopefully will bear some fruit. But let's move on to LA United 2. They unfortunately fell to Orlando City B, 3-2 at Fifth Third, State, uh, Fifth Third Bank Stadium uh, on Saturday afternoon. And, uh, yeah. Midfielder Javier Armas and defender Efren Morales each claimed their first goal of the season. Which, uh, fun fact about Javier Armas. So, soccer down here was able to uh, figure out who put the butter in their coffee. And uh, they revealed that uh, it might be Javier Armas. The, uh, the Atlanta United 2 player. Which, uh, you know, everybody speculated that it might be a first team player. But, uh, yep. Yeah. That's that wrench that gets thrown in the conversation is that uh, it's an LA United 2 player. No one could have prognosticated. But um, yeah, Javier Armas uh, also is doing a, a vlog on YouTube uh, about his match days. And uh, I think, I believe, some of the days in between too. So uh, yeah, definitely check it out. It's uh, definitely some insightful stuff into how their days go. So super cool but uh yeah lni2 they will return to action on sunday uh and they will play carolina core fc at fifth third bank stadium but uh yep yeah, so moving on from that uh that does it for the news and it gets us into the mailbag and you guys send in these questions through ig story and our discord and uh, please continue to do so, and we might answer your question in the future. But uh, the Patreon, the highest level tiers, uh, those members get the priority. And so uh, first up is Drew. He asks, what are you looking for in our depth versus Toronto, specifically Firmino, Jamal, Cobb, and Dax? Um, for me, I'm looking for them to be able to hold Toronto to a draw, that would be great. That would be a super good result for us. Um, that's pretty much my expectation, my hope. Um, realistically speaking, I don't know if they'll be able to. However, that to me should be the goal. I think that they can hang their hats on that if that happens and they should, they should feel proud of themselves. I mean, like looking at the difference 
in like money value talent level stardom everything between these two teams that will be going up against each other on saturday like i it's just night and day so like if they can hold to a draw that would be monumental um mm. that that's what i'm hoping for yeah it's a very astute question from drew as well because uh those probably are the people that uh are the players that are going to be starting so yeah. we'll see but uh yeah, I mean, definitely from those players. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's a level of, I think, just it's competence. You know, like the hope is that they can uh, piece together the lines that, uh, because pretty much these guys are going to be the spine of the team. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, every one of them does not have, uh, besides Dax, I mean, these guys aren't, I guess, uh, a foot with a ton of experience. So, you know, Firmino, Jamal, uh, Ortiari, and uh, and Cobb, they're yeah, you know, it's a uh, it's gonna be a thing where, you know, in MLS, they're learning. So, but Gavin asks, does this team have what it takes to get a positive result out of Toronto, such as at least a draw? But the fact that we have two of our best attackers out and best defender injured and away from home makes it a very tough, or it makes it very tough. And, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Now, I'll say that it's possible we can get a draw. I don't think it's likely, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility, like I said, and I think that they should aim for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's hope. <laughs> Fingers <laughs> crossed that they can do it. Right. And I think it's this, it's like, uh, in terms of getting a positive result, yeah, if it was a draw uh, or three points, I mean, I think it will come from uh, some of our players that, well, I mean, Nick Firmino, it's uh, every time he plays, he he's want to score. And I mean, he's the player that's motivated. He, he has the eye for goal. I mean, I think if anybody, he, he uh, in terms of contribution to this match, I think he will have something that he wants to prove. Like he, he will really try to push uh, for a starting spot. I mean, you know, Shonda Silva, you know, like that could be a spot that he could usurp if he plays better in some senses. Uh, now he might not be a out and out winger, but I mean, if some of the guys are a little loose with their uh, with their passing, I mean, it's it's like this. It's like Derek Etienne. You know, now he's a supplemental roster player. Like, even though he's on pretty high wages. Like, I mean, if you don't perform, there will be other players that, uh, you know, will come in. So, you know, Shauna Silva, uh, maybe not the best uh, in terms of starts. But, uh, you know, could be. Firmino could uh, could come for a spot here. So, but so you, you said three points. Let me just address that for a minute. Sure. If we win in Toronto <laughs> against this Toronto team with mm -hmm. what we're going to put out there, mm -hmm. uh, I will, if if the like the Toron uh, Toronto's uh, front office puts out like a commemorative like, you know, match scarf, you know, where it has, you know, Toronto Atlanta on it uh, mm -hmm. and the date or whatever, I will find one and buy one because mm -hmm. there's like, that is a game you have to remember. Like... <laughs> Like that will be one of the biggest upsets I will have ever seen in MLS if we could find a way to beat Toronto in their own house when they have the star power they have. Granted, yeah, their team has been reeling. They're not, you know, the last couple of years there's been difficulties with them all over their organization. But you know, they there is no reason why they shouldn't win like there really isn't like it, it's it would be insanity in my opinion if, if we are able to walk out of there with three points i think a draw is at least conceivable but man if we get three points not only will i be ecstatic and scream it from the top of the roof but i'm gonna i'm gonna if they make one of those commemorative spar uh, scarves i'm gonna get one yeah well it's usually not the the team that makes that it's usually some street vendor and uh it's not really that common in the states unfortunately but my god if they make one yeah man absolutely you should get it and uh yeah frame that shit but 
What, yeah. a, what a game if that's if that happens. Exactly. Um, okay, next question comes from uh, Josh Cohen fan. Uh, with Guzan so showing a glimpse of his era coming to a close with the scary scene of another leg injury about to happen, will we see Pineda start Cohen in more games like the USOC and Leagues Cup and even some MLS action? I mean, yeah, I, I think uh, there might be a cup keeper, you know, in this uh, as well. Like Josh Cohen probably will start a lot of the cup games. If not, uh, you know, if he doesn't usurp him, in terms of Guzan. And if he doesn't, or if he does, then I think you might see the other way around. So, you know, yeah. it's uh, it's one of those... Yeah, Guzan's not going to play every single game. That's for sure. But, uh, yeah, you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I completely agree. I think he's going to... Um, go, he's going to be a cup keeper unless he steals the job from... Brad Guzan, and then Brad Guzan might be then the cup keeper we use uh, for that. So I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable assessment. Um, I think you can predict, you can kind of um, put all the all of your uh, all of your eggs in that basket. Yeah, I think the real question is when. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, next question comes from Candy Dish. Uh, that was an Easter joke, by the way. Oh, it's, nice. Easter's coming up. Hey. hey. <laughs> too subtle for me <laughs> but uh yeah candy dish asks we haven't seen jamal tiara play really play so much now that we need him is there extra pressure on him does he receive extra scrutiny along the same lines if we want to win trophies we need to ha have a depth how do we feel about our depth and the way the fo goes about filling those holes yeah i i uh i think there will be more scrutiny on Jamal now that the spotlight will be on him. Um, he knew this was going to be a thing he'd have to do, you know, um, and this is what he's here to do. It's, this is what he's getting paid to do is fill in for when Gigi's not here. And hopefully he can, you know, net us some goals and put us above the bar. But now that we have Daniel in this, I think ratchets it, ratchets it up even more. And now he's going to feel the pressure even more. Um, and that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. These players, if they're good, if they have a good mentality about it, should want competition, should want challenge, because that's how you grow. That's how you get better as a professional. And that can only help us as a team on the whole. Right. And that's the thing. It's like, uh, as the saying goes, pressure makes diamonds, but it's also Yogurt Nakamakis. He invites that extra scrutiny. You know, he... Uh, <laughs> Him saying they already know me, you know that type of stuff. It's it's that bravado that uh, it forces you to back it up. Give me and the number seven jersey. Yeah, exactly. Like stuff like that. I, I would hope Tiare embraces it. And yeah, you kind of have to be if you're yeah. wanting to be a striker, in my opinion. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know why you would be in that position if you mm -hmm. were, you know, shy of like you know the big lights and all the pressure. So. Exactly. Yeah, if you are a, you know, if you're adverse to the limelight, that's probably not the profession for you. It's probably not the position for you, rather. But, yeah, no, definitely very, very interesting. But, uh, yep, yeah, so those are the questions uh, this week in the mailbag. And, uh, yeah, uh, keep sending those, and we might answer your question in the future. But... Let's get into the match preview then and 7.30 on Saturday. LA United will face off against Toronto FC. We've uh, we've talked about a good number of things uh, pertaining to this match, but uh, there are definitely some other things that uh, we need to get to regarding this. But it'll be at BMO Field. Uh, yeah, obviously, like we mentioned, the uh, the six players called up for the FIFA International window. Uh you know, Steon Gregerson as well being injured. Uh, but Toronto FC, uh, yeah, they, they're they on this uh, kind of redemption train a little bit because last year they were the wooden spoon winner. And they and really make... the most expensive rosters. Yeah. It's like the most inverse team in the league you could possibly have like in terms of result and how much money you spend exactly and it's it's wild because uh yeah 
They didn't really make a lot of high-level additions to the roster uh, over the uh, over the winter, but uh, Michael Bradley, probably uh, one of their you know their legends, he retired after the 2023 season. Uh, C.J. Sapong also wasn't brought back. Victor Vasquez, another stalwart for them. He now uh, is playing in India. Uh, they did bring in Davey Flores and Tyrese Spicer, but uh, yeah, I mean, not a lot, not a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, reinforcements, but uh, they're a team that's somehow, uh, despite uh, what pundits are saying, that they will finish 14th or 15th, uh, maybe as high as 11th for some, uh, but yeah, they're in the throes of the Eastern Conference is what most people are thinking. But uh, yeah, their new head coach, John Herdman, he uh, yeah, is pulling some magic out right now and maybe uh, getting the best, maybe not the best, but getting better out of uh, these players. And, you know, they're in fifth right now. So the problem is, yeah, we never play really too well at BMO Field. We do not win there. And it's the whole thing. We uh, we have some difficulty winning in Canada for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, uh, it's also, yeah, with the uh, the press conferences uh, in the lead-up to this match, Ronald Hernandez, Jamal Tiare, spoke with, uh, you know, the media. And, uh, yeah, he said, or he mentioned that he believes the game against Toronto will be a good chance for other players to show growth. He said, quote, this is a good opportunity for them and for all of us. We know we are going to miss them because they are important in terms of the other players that I had left. But this is football. This is an opportunity for the new guys to show up. And Tiara mentioned, at the end of the day, everybody on the team is important. The goal is to listen to the coach, maintain your position, and just keep it all together. Not exactly, you know really encouraging stuff it just sounds like players that are uh holding down the fort but uh yep you know I, I, you had mentioned a little bit earlier but it's just yeah these are those words and yeah <laughs> i'm it doesn't instill a lot of confidence no <laughs> i i'm concerned i am more than just concerned this uh this could be a drubbing but I have a I have a meme. Maybe yeah. I can send it to you. Maybe we can put it on this episode or something. Yeah. Put throw it up on the screen. But I posted it last year. Um, I, I I don't remember where I found it. I posted it last year. Uh, where like you know the guys like screaming like we were on a break Hell when yeah. Columbus beat us like six one or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ross from Friends. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That right. was that's a great meme, and I'm and I'm. I'm going to have to break it out again. Yeah. You might. Uh, but, yeah, Toronto, uh, in terms of their unavailable players, they pretty much uh, not missing too many players. Uh, only fullback Richie Laria, and uh, he might miss three months uh, with hamstring surgery that he had on March 23rd. And that was announced on Tuesday. But other than that, uh, yeah, you know, no one really from their starting lineup. I think there's one guy, there's a midfielder um, that's started for them all, every game this season so far, but uh, I don't think he's a main cog for them per se. Yeah. Um, like, I don't think he's, like, uh, vital to them, but, like, right. you know, it, it, it that's something, I guess, to pay attention <laughs> to. Yeah, well, okay, we'll, we'll say two. Two yeah, versus it our... Matter. Exactly. Yeah. Two versus our seven, which is Theon Gregerson, like I said, with the meniscus injury. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it pretty much it makes, actually, this starting 11 fairly interesting to predict. And here we are. Let's go. <laughs> so, uh, the uh, you know, going from the back, uh, it might be the easiest from now. Yeah. So, uh, Guzan between the sticks, obviously. Uh, same for you. Yep. Yeah. All right. I, then, I wouldn't hate if Cohen came out, but yeah, it's going to be Guzan. Right. And in that back line, well, yeah, I mean, the fullbacks, let's go with those. Who do you think is going to play? Uh, 
Lennon on the right, Hernandez on the left. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that much is pretty obvious uh, without Wiley. Uh, really, I mean, McFadden maybe, but uh, I think Hernandez kind of has that uh, that backup spot. Uh, yeah, if covered. he doesn't play now, why is he on the team? Like, right. <laughs> yeah, and it's also like he gave a you know a press conference. It's yeah, it's gonna be Ronald Hernandez. Uh, okay, the center backs. Who do you think it's gonna be? Um, Cobb and Williams. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, no Cobb. Uh, I mean, he had a really good preseason. So yeah. you know, it's not. I'm not really too concerned from a defensive standpoint. But from a building out from the back standpoint, okay, yeah, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, he's kind of an unknown quantity, so you know, it's uh. But I, I like the decision making that uh, Noah Cobb has had, and Derek Williams obviously has been pretty solid uh, in the first three matches and the preseason. Uh, getting into the midfield, this is where also it could get interesting. Uh, but uh, with the players that are out. Probably pretty easy, but uh, Muyamba being one of them, and who's who's the six in terms of uh, you know who you think? I think it's going to be Dax McCarty. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, it it's odd. It's a uh, you know you have a lot of players out, but it's almost it's almost picking itself because of the available players and the experience. I would say because. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you don't really have many other options here. It's really right. it. Yeah, because uh, like we talked about before, you've, um, you know, dinged on a few times is that we are lacking at least like one more player in the midfield. So yeah. it makes the choice a little bit easier. Exactly. Which uh, it's not a good, it's not an embarrassment of riches. That's, yeah, like when, uh, when starters go out, you almost want, yeah, you know, like multiple options. But uh, nope, that's not what we have here. Yeah, uh, I feel like we're like the most deep in like striker right now. It feels like. <laughs> yeah, which is super odd. But yeah, uh, yeah, and then into the wings, I think uh, these pick itself, uh, Saba Silva. Yeah, uh, you know that's gonna be uh, at least the uh, the stalwarts in the, at least so far. But uh, yeah, it's the who's gonna play the other midfield role uh, in terms of centrally. I mean, probably going to be Nick Firmino, you think? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I, like it, it could be interesting if, like, I remember I've heard people talk about Lob Janice possibly, like, entering in the 10 role or something like that, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's that could be interesting, and then throw like Edmund Mascara out on the wing to start things. Like, yeah. that couldn't that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world but i think we'll probably see firmino i mean hell give him a chance why not um it's not like the the game matters that much in my eyes yeah. um but i mean I, I, this has been a little doom and gloom but keep in mind this is not a foregone conclusion we can absolutely yeah. get a result if we're lucky and we play well and the other team maybe is a little bit off we can absolutely bankrupt them so we yeah. it can happen we have to watch, see what happens, but like, you know, it's, it's we're up against it though. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, for sure. It's a, uh, yeah. If we smash and grab, yeah, there's a possibility. Uh, are we going to uh, have the lion's share of the possession? I, I would not bet on it. That's a, uh, th that's a foolhardy uh, wager, I would say. So no, don't do that. Uh, if you're a betting man or woman or person. But uh, yeah, up top, who you got? Um, it's got to be Jamal. Um, yep. mm -hmm. He's this is his time. This is where you have to, you know, put up or shut up. This is what you get paid for. Um, hopefully, he can produce something. Um, it'd be crazy if it was a miracle and we ended up, you know, you know, smashing and grabbing. But like, yeah. I will be okay if we get a draw out of this and he contributes to that result. Um, they all contribute to that result. That would be magnificent, I think. Um, maybe masterclass in terms of tactics too. Pineda might need to get a, you know, like a hat tipped his direction as well. So we'll see how it ends up. But like this game is, you can get a result here. So we'll see how it it, um, it filters out. Right. And yeah, you know, with Pineda saying 
some of those things uh, post match. That you know he's not averse to playing a low block to yeah, pretty much trying to hit teams on the counter. I mean, I think if there was a match, this is the match to kind of do that. Unfortunately, and the the real question is, how do we how do we subvert that expectation a little bit? Because I mean, Toronto is probably expecting that as well. So they're going to have to figure out a way to break us down. The question is if we can stay compact enough, and if we're well drilled enough this week that we don't get drawn out into positions where we are susceptible to concede. And, yeah. you know, that, it, just, that, it, mm-hmm. it can be, it can get really ugly if yeah. like Lorenzo Insigne hits like a screamer from outside the box, isn't it? No one thought to close him down enough like he kind of did the other week. Um, that can just, then all of a sudden, now we got to go chase the game and we're already starting to get drawn out like that. That can just, that could spell yeah. really, really bad <laughs> result. So. Yes, yes. So, yeah, that gets us to what the result might be. So, score prediction time. What do you got? I think think this will probably be a uh, I, I don't think we're going to score anything so I think we're going to lose 1-0 mm. yeah uh, I think I originally had that uh, before I uh, yeah in going into the match or going into this match preview but yeah, I mean, talking through, and it's also, I mean, just the, the players themselves, it's like, they're not match fit. <laughs> they're going to be chasing, probably, at some point, uh, in terms of, you know, just working really, really hard defensively. It's going to wear us down. I think there's more than one goal, unfortunately. I think this is a 3 0 loss. And, uh, you know, it's not going to do wonders for our our goal difference it's uh, not exactly a a thing that uh, in this league is uh, a massive importance as well so yeah chalk it up and you know it's uh, it's not a it's not a, a glimmering saturday unfortunately I but uh, you played a team that also is missing like 6 to 7 players like you know, right. it's it's the unlucky uh you know, scheduling gods that yeah. have, uh, you know, kind of, it's often the case on the road. We, At least uh, it wasn't Columbus again. Yeah. I mean, if it was just Columbus, it was just, yeah, exactly. At that point, just, uh, you know, can you forfeit before the match? Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, we don't have to is, go through all this. Is Cucho Hernandez <laughs> called up to his, his nation's team? Uh, I don't know, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good question. That would be wild. Know, it's like right? if it you just, get Cucho and Nagby to just like demolish a, a basically a USL team, that's that's right. not funny. It's, <laughs> it's really not. I mean that that therein lies the problem of the crux of the argument here. But uh, yep. So uh, we got one nil. We got three nil. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments below. But that guys is pretty much the episode there and there, except for the question of the day. The question of the day is, what would you guys like to see from us content-wise? We'd love to hear what you guys think. And yeah, we'll consider doing what uh, those suggestions are. So get at us in those comments. But that is the episode, guys. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. That's Michael. I'm AJ. Thank you so much for watching. And we will see you in the next video.